and others, maybe not so much. So we'll start out with a few basics and then we'll make some distinctions and then we'll delve into some areas that I know will pique your interest. So, Okay, finally got it up. And so walk this way and join me in a virtual tour of wetlands, ordinary or extraordinary. I'm gonna to try to move something around here and see if this will help how you can see my screen. To define a wetland is really simple. It's as its name suggests, wet land. Not just a little damp, soggy, saturated, waterlogged, really wet, we call it, hydric soil. And water, water is either covering the land, covering that hydric soil, or the water table is right up near the surface. And the plants that grow there, they are the plants that love wet feet. We call them I'm, I'm going to have to stop sharing for a moment. Something's not working right here. Okay, we call them hydrophytic plants. And here is a partial list of the many that you might see in a wetland. We have rushes and sedges, cardinal flower, swamp milkweed, and the telltale cattail. If you see cattails, it's pretty certain that you're just about to identify a wetland. We know the three criteria now. Let's try to determine if what we're seeing here is a wetland. It has water. It certainly has plenty of water. Does it have hydric soil? The soil to me looks like beach sand, the kind you can sift through your fingers. So we do not have hydric soil. And the hydrophytic vegetation, no, we have marum grass here that tends to grow in clumps and hold down the dune so that it doesn't take a walk. So the criteria are not met. This is not a wetland. The picture here is, however. And the water that we find in wetlands can be standing still or it can be moving. It can have a current. Even though it's a slight current, it can have a current. You might even see water marks on trees in a wetland where during times of some flooding, the water is up higher than it normally is, then when it recedes, you see a watermark on the trees. You might even see a thin layer of dusty looking sediment everywhere in the wetland. There are some soil indicators as well. We can see different colors of soil, different textures, different types of soil. And I find the most interesting to be the odor of hydrogen sulfide if you are to disturb the silt at the bottom of the pond. Now, in order to figure out how a wetland fits into the grand scheme of things, let's start with a watershed. Anywhere- Victoria, I'm so sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. Uh, we cannot see your presentation. You can't see it? No, no, no. I'm gonna, I'm gonna escape from it and try to come in again. Okay, okay, sorry. <laughs> That's all right.
Can you see it now? Um, no. I think you have to go back to Zoom and hit share screen again. That's what I'm doing. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, okay, perfect. Now, let me see if when it plays, if you can still see it. Okay. That's, that's where we seem to hit a snag. Yeah. <laughs> Are we good? Yes. Okay, I'm going to advance to where I left off. Okay. Okay, this was the area that we couldn't identify as a wetland. It's clearly uh, the dunes. And this was the next slide that is a wetland. And we talked about watermarks and thin layers of sediment. And then we talked about the soil types and the odor of rotten eggs, the hydrogen sulfide. This is a cutaway of a wetland and we're gonna try and figure out how a wetland figures into the grand scheme of things. This was a really lucky find on the internet. It shows that when water falls on a wetland, gravity pulls it down so that water will travel from the highest point of a wetland to the lowest point. When it gets there, what does it do? Well, it sits there but then it ever so slowly releases from the wetland and goes on toward the ocean. The way that the determination is made, which way the water will flow, is partly by the slant, the topography of the watershed, and also by a structure that we have here in Porter County that's really unusual. Again, two more lucky finds on the internet. The photo, or the, the map rather, the drawing on the left shows Lake Chicago, the ancient Lake Michigan, and it shows the Glenwood stage or shore of the lake. That corresponds to this uh, newer map. This one shows the Glenwood stage and it veers off to the east and tends to follow along roughly with Route 30. There are two watersheds in Porter County. One is the Calumet watershed. The other is the Glenwood or the Kankakee watershed. It corresponds with this map. We have here the Glenwood stage or the Kankakee watershed. We have the Calumet stage or the Calumet water stage. And this tickled me pink when I, when I saw it on this map. This shows also the Tolleston water stage. I couldn't find a, 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 an old geologic map of Indiana, but this one of Illinois will do just fine. The lake is up here, the current shore that we know it. But this one, the reason I was so thrilled to get it is right here on the Tolleston um, uh, shore, shore of Lake Michigan, the Tolleston stage. That's where I grew up, right there in this sandy dune and swale area that I enjoyed so much as a kid. Now, if you come back here, this again is the Glenwood stage. This little island, I, I don't know if you can read it on your screens. This little island has a name and the name is Blue Island. Sometimes we wonder where, our, where names of cities originate. This area that's shaded in is called the Valparaiso Moraine. It's a very important area. It's made of glacial till. When the, when the glaciers advanced, they pushed ahead of it, rock, gravel, stones. Then the glacier receded a bit. Then it advanced and receded and advanced. Each time it came forward, it pushed more glacial till ahead of it. Then it receded a good deal and did the same thing over here on the Calumet watershed. 
Um, and this one tends to follow Ridge Road, the ridge of the watershed. And here again, the same thing happened at the Tolleston stage. That Valpo Moraine is really an important place. It begins in the western part of Michigan, follows Lake Michigan shore all the way through Indiana, through Illinois, and up across the Wisconsin line. So we have this glacial till that goes all the way around the lower portion of the lake. The reason it's so important to us here is the Valpo Moraine has a continental divide, just like the Rockies do. The Rockies divide our precipitation if the water tends to fall on the right side of that continental divide, it flows to the east. If it falls on the west, the water falls to the west. With the Valpo Moraine, you can bank on the fact that if water falls in precipitation to the north of that continental divide of the Moraine, it will flow toward Lake Michigan follow the Great Lakes through to the St. Lawrence River and out to find the ocean because water wants to find the ocean. If it falls south of the Valpo Moraine, the water will find its way through tributaries to the Kankakee and then to the Mississippi and then to the Gulf because water wants to find the ocean. And notice, please, in this cutaway, the proximity of wetlands to groundwater. Before we leave this slide altogether, we see the Valpo Moraine and the track that it falls. Be aware that when you visit Gabus Arboretum, you're on the Valpo Moraine. Okay, so now we know everything there is to know about wetlands. So what's the big deal? Why should, why should we even care? Well, here's the thing. I've done this, maybe you've done it too. Had a late night, had to get up early the next morning, come shuffling into the kitchen in my bunny slippers and grab the coffee gotta make a pot of coffee. And I drum my fingers on the counter, waiting for it to brew. Finally, it's done. I grab the biggest mug I have and I fill my cup with murky brown liquid. I forgot to put in the coffee filter. We can equate a water, a uh, wetland with a coffee filter, a giant coffee filter. When that water dribbles down through a watershed, it passes through many different areas. It can pass through industrial areas or farms or grazing pastures through rural areas, through urban areas. The water is going everywhere. And when it does, it picks up pollutants so that by the time the water gets to a wetland, it's pretty dirty. The water sits there in the wetland and through the action of the soil and plants, the water is purified so that by the time it leaves the wetland, it is, it is, it is cleaner, excuse me, I thought we had Tilly solved, evidently not. So that by the time that water leaves the wetland, it's cleaner than when it went in. That's a huge deal. Okay, throw away the image of the, the uh, coffee filter and substitute a sponge, a dried desiccated sponge. And then you wet the sponge. and it becomes saturated. You know, 
in the, in the era of climate change that we're experiencing, we've seen some real <laughs> rip snorter sponges, excuse me, rip snorting storms. They're really gully washers. And often they happen during dry times in the summer, a little bit of a drought perhaps, the ground is hard, it rains and it rains and it rains and we know that the ground is not going to accept that water because it's so hard so dry it's like spitting in the dust and if it rains for a few days then we have flood conditions and where does that water go it goes into a wetland and a lot of it will go into a wetland but the wetland is the flattest part of that watershed the flattest part, and it's got some elbow room. It can accommodate flood water. It's part of its functions. And what does that water do? It sits there and ever so slowly releases the water to go and find the ocean, thereby mitigating flooding. This is looking better all the time. Now we know, scientists have told us, that we're not to release any CO2 into the atmosphere. It's a bad thing. Wetlands, my friends, sequester carbon. Wetlands store carbon. And the only time it's released is if a wetland is destroyed. Now we remember the uh, proximity of wetlands to groundwater and aquifers. And we know if we've been paying attention that our aquifers are getting dangerously low on water. But not all the water from a, a wetland goes out to find the ocean. Some of it goes straight down into the ground to replenish groundwater and recharge aquifers. Super important, especially here in Indiana, since we have 70% of our population who depend on groundwater for drinking. And this tickles me most of all. Wetlands are said to be the most diverse ecosystem on the planet. We're told that coral reefs and rainforests are biologically rich. And now we know that we can include wetlands in that same category. If you were to look at a drop of wetland water under a microscope, you would see that it is teeming with life. The animals, the plants that are native to wetlands are astounding. Think about this. When birds migrate, they follow a migration route. Scientists have no idea of, of how that, that route is determined. Now that includes waterfowl, geese, sandhill cranes, they follow a migration route, and on that route are wetlands. And the migrators, the migrate migrants, find those wetlands. They land there for a place of refreshment and rest. Now, what if some of those wetlands weren't there in that migration route that these birds have been following for centuries? Food for thought. And what do wetlands do for us as individuals, each one of us personally? What good is a wetland to me? I can go to a wetland, for instance, the one at Gabus. I can go sit in the wetland overlook and I can see how nature functions firsthand, up close and personal. If I sit there for a while, the critters forget that I'm there and I might see 
a kingfisher swoop down out of a snag and snatch up a fish. I might see a great blue heron fishing near the shore. I might see dabbling ducks doing their thing. It's a place where children can learn. It can be a classroom. So bring your kids, bring your grandkids, because when children are learned to appreciate nature, they carry that experience with them through adulthood, just like I did, just like you do. They learn to be good stewards of the earth as adults. And then there's recreation. Some wetlands allow hunting, fishing, canoeing. At some wetlands, we can bring our photo equipment and take gorgeous photos, or we can paint a beautiful picture. We can do research in a wetland, or you can go there just to be. And then there's a side benefit, the fish and shellfish that come from wetlands, the blueberries, cranberries, wild rice. Oh, the wild rice in Northern Wisconsin. So wonderful. Some medicinal herbs even grow in wetlands. And then there's the peat. The gardeners know all about that. And personally, I'm gonna get on my soapbox and say I don't use peat anymore. I've switched to quar. Diversity in a wetland brings us to the food web that we find. The food web is created to work in concert when all the parts are present. Work in concert. And we know how a food web works. Um, the big ones depend on the smaller ones all the way down the line. Um, and if, say, for instance, we can look at just three of the components of the wetland, three of them. And they graduate in size from higher to lower, tallest to shortest. Let's say, for instance, in this group of three, this little segment of the food web, let's say that the middle one is no longer there. In that case, the one at the top of the heap is getting nothing because its source is gone. So it pretty much withers and fades away. So much for working in concert. Now, the one just below the missing link is not being depended upon, not getting eaten, and it explodes population-wise. So everything is out of balance. And the wetland is going to behave like a bicycle wheel that is missing much of its spoke. A lot of the spokes are gone. You're going to have a bumpy ride. Eventually, the wheel will collapse. I don't want to think about that in a wetland, but it can happen. A study by Purdue has revealed something even more startling. When diversity in a wetland decreases, disease increases. So the wetland is hit by a double whammy. It's missing portions of its food web, so it's not functioning properly. And then it's hit with disease. Not a good thing. So all the more reason to maintain the diversity of a wetland. And one last point, one third of endangered species must rely on wetlands. One third of the endangered critters out there need a wetland to, sub to survive. Are all wetlands always wet? No, actually they're not. We have something called a vernal wetland. Um, it's fleeting, it's short-lived, it's ephemeral. It's like ephemeral flowers that are here today and gone tomorrow. 
at the end of the winter, we have snow melt that's got to find a place. And it tends to collect in low spots. And then we have some spring rains that also feed that little wet spot until it becomes a small pond. There are no fish in that pond. And soon as the toads and frogs discover that, they jump right in. Nothing can eat their eggs. So they lay a bunch of eggs in those little vernal ponds. The eggs hatch. The toads and frogs are growing. And once they, they resorb their tails and have all four of their legs, it's time to leave the pond. And it's also time for the pond to dry up. It's summer. And the pond will come back again the following year. Have you ever noticed all the dragonflies that show up at a particular time in the summer near water features? That's because they spend their initial years, initial time in water, and then they become these big bombers, the, the dragonflies that have a voracious appetite for mosquitoes. Neat to know. And one last point about wetlands in general. We're told that they are transition zones that link water and the land. And think about how water flows from the land in a watershed and it finds its way to the ocean. And when it does, it's protecting the land, the air, and the water. It's sequestering carbon from going up into the atmosphere. It's cleansing the water, cleansing the land, protecting the land, the air, and the water. Good stuff. Um, this little beaver that came up out of the pond in my backyard <laughs> is here to tell us that wetlands are divided into four separate categories. We have marshes that concentrate on wetlands. We have swamps that focus more on woody plants. And then we have bogs that are very, very unique. And lastly, fens. Here is a marsh where the water tends to be more shallow. Um, it, it exists over rather poor land. The soil under it doesn't have much to offer. The water in a marsh can be fresh water or salt water, as, as in coastal marshes. And the water um, from a wetland can either be near a lake or near a river. And you know, it's funny how we can see something, pass it by in our car a hundred times, and we know it's there and we just don't take careful note of it. But once we understand what it is, then we can't help looking at it every time we go by. Um, that's like some friends of mine um, to whom I explained what Phragmites is and how nasty it is. Now that they know what it is, um, it reminds them every time they go down the street, down a country road, down uh, a rural area road, just exactly what they're seeing. They now, they see it where they just knew it was there in the past and passed it by. Swamps have some different features. The, move, the movement of water in a wetland is apparent in a swamp. Swamp water is deeper. It covers a wider area. It does have a current. Sometimes it's imperceptible, but it is there. And with that current, the water in the beautiful Oki Finoki Swamp actually does drain into the ocean. It goes into the Atlantic via the St. Mary River and it goes into the Gulf via the Suwannee River. In the Oki Finoki, we can see cypress trees, the, the trees with the knees, and we can see Swamp Tupelo as well. Not all of the Oki Finoki is actual swamp land. Some of it's drier, and it has different types of trees, um, more conifer type trees than the actual swamp area itself. The Oki Finoki in 1937 was declared a preserve by FDR. He saw what it was. 
And among the, all the other things that he accomplished, he made the Okefenokee a preserve. And to this day, it's still partly a reserve, partly a refuge, partly private land. It's, it's a convolution of different um, ownerships of, of the land. But to this day, you can go there. You can fish. You can recreate. It's an amazing nearly 700 square miles. And the diversity in the Okefenokee is phenomenal. Some of the animals that are there are the same ones that we see here, beavers, otters. And yes, we do have bobcat here because I saw one a couple years ago um, that was snooping around the wetland behind my house. It was amazing, amazing. The birds, yeah, there are a lot of birds at the Okefenokee. 200 species of birds are in that swamp. 60 species of amphibians that include the ever popular pig frog that instead of croaking has a tendency to snort and grunt. And then there's the three foot long salamander. Yes, there are plenty of gators at the Okefenokee and there are about five different species of poisonous snakes. Want to keep your eyes open when you visit there. Oh, and I almost forgot. There are 400 species of mammals in that swamp. Glacial kettle lakes. That's how we define a bog. And how does that happen? A chunk, a large chunk of a receding glacier can break off. It might be covered with glacial till so that it only very slowly melts. And while it's there for a very long time, it compresses the land underneath. So much so that it becomes impermeable to water. No water in that lake can escape to the ground water no groundwater has access to the lake. So how is evaporated water to be replaced in a bog? Only by precipitation and groundwater. Groundwater flows in around the perimeter of the bog, diluting the acidity of it. Because the inner part of the bog, the central part is very acidic. For those of you who are familiar with the canning process, you might use 5% vinegar. Well, some bogs can be that acidic. They can even be acidic as orange juice. So not only are they acidic, they are low in nutrients and comprise a part of this pretty simple ecosystem. The last type of bog is a fen and it has one central difference from a bog. And we'll discuss that in a minute. A couple years ago in the winter, I gathered up my photo equipment and drove down 421 and east to Pinhook Bog. If you have never been there, you must go. It was closed this year to tours and I'm only hoping that it will open up next year to um, reservation tours um, to keep social distancing. When I came there, I took a photo of entering the bog. And we can see the boardwalk that allows you to enter and go to the very end to the central part of the bog. It allows you to see what grows there, what lives there. Um, here's a person on the bog taking pictures of something along the edge. It could be a fern. Um, it's too late in the year for orchids, but there's always something to photograph there. We can see the tamarack trees are losing their needles. We know tamaracks um, lose their needles much like a maple tree. They're deciduous conifers. There are bushes here. Here's what appears to be a blueberry. It has changed color, and that's what I was looking for. How do things look in a bog in fall? Here's some young ferns, baby ones, along the edge. 
And this right here is the beginning of the moat I have to, I have to point out. Those ferns turn a beautiful color in the fall. They turn a pale orange color and they're edged in brown. They're quite beautiful. And these little white doodads uh, and more white doodads here, those are rusty cotton grass. Let's take a closer look. Pinhook plant life. Yes, it is specialized and it is unique. What we're seeing here is a button bush, just a little bit of a button bush. We're seeing a few leaves and the inflorescence. If you were to try to make a um, Christmas decoration, a Christmas tree decoration for your tree, you might take a styrofoam ball and roll it in glue and then roll it in snow glitter, the kind of fluffy, puffy, sparkly snow glitter, and then hang that ball on your Christmas tree. This looks kind of similar, only it's not glittery. And what you're seeing is, is not um, a glitter type material. It's tiny little flowers, hundreds and hundreds of little flowers with their flower petals, creating this lovely sphere. And what's extending from the ball are anthers and stamen that give it that pretty, pretty unique look. Here's a list of what you might see at Pinhook Bog. We talked about the tamaracks and the ferns. If you notice a thread here, the common thread is acid loving plants. Holly likes an acid atmosphere. So do cranberry and blueberries. And we have then the orchids. The orchids are phenomenal. In the spring, not fall, in the spring, the pink lady, lady slipper orchids are absolutely breathtaking. The colonies of them that grow at Pinhook are getting bigger every year. And the last time I was there, there were colonies of 12 to 15 blooms all coming out at the same time, breathtaking. And the spring, one spring trip that I took there, I was fortunate to see orange fringed orchids. And I was even happier when the pictures that I took of them turned out, you can see all the, the kind of delicate little fringes on the orchids. We have sphagnum moss that grows at Pinhook and a lot of it. We'll see that shortly. And the last thing that we're going to look at here are the carnivores. You don't just see carnivores anywhere. Again, they are unique. And here's one. I love this picture. We've got, we've got two of the pictures here. This one in the front, um, we only see the top of it. The one in the back is partially hidden. What you're seeing here is not a flower. It's a leaf, a modified leaf. Picture in your mind's eye a flat leaf that has evolved over time to curl up and close so that it actually becomes a vessel to hold liquid. And that fin that goes up the front may be what is left of the flat leaf. And I believe that it performs a function. I believe that here comes a little buggy and it detects on this fin what lies ahead. Something absolutely irresistible to a little buggy, something sticky and sweet. And certainly the animal finds it on this lip that is the base of the tip of the original leaf. It has evolved to form a hood. So the buggy is on the lip, enjoying that sweet sticky goo. And then it decides to explore inside. Is there more of that good stuff down inside? When it gets down inside, it realizes that the pitcher is filled with liquid. It doesn't want to go any further. So it turns around to come out and it meets these white dashes. They look like little white dashes on the hood. My friends, they are thorns and they are downward facing so that even if a little mousy gets in there, 
it can't get back out because of those downward facing thorns. Eventually the creature falls in, drowns, and then something really strange happens. It's not water from the rain or snow melt, only inside that pitcher. It's enzymes that the pitcher exudes into the water and that drowned animal, be it insect, mousy, what have you, is then digested and absorbed by the pitcher. The water in a bog is acidic. We know that now. It also contains something else that comes from the sphagnum moss that has made it acidic. The moss also exudes other chemicals that allow the plant to grow and this water is not getting a whole lot. It's not giving a whole lot to the plant. It's not nutrient rich. As a matter of fact, it's nutrient poor. So this plant, amazingly, has learned to feed itself. I know you want to ask me, why are some of these pitchers green and some of them are red? It's the sun. If the pitcher is in exposed sun, it's going to be red. If it's going to be in the shade, it will be green. If it's in a combination, you'll have those pitchers that are part red, part green. Here's the, the flower from a pitcher plant, kind of unusual looking, kind of looks like a, a daffodil and then not. It's got these um, petals in the back that I don't believe are petals. I believe they're sepals. And it's got this shield-shaped affair on the front protecting the reproductive parts. But then there are areas that are cut away almost that will admit the pollinators. And down here, I believe we have some blue-eyed cotton grass. There are a couple of other carniv carnivores at uh, pin hook. One is a sundew. It functions much like a Venus flytrap. Here's the business end, and it has trichomes that are coming out of that leaf. The trichomes at the tip, they're, they're hair-like structures of a plant, and they're modified on this particular plant to serve a purpose. On the end of each trichome is a droplet of sweet sticky goo, the irresistible thing to plants. When the insect lands, while its uh, attention is diverted by enjoying that sweet sticky goo, the leaf is closing. Before you know it, the leaf is altogether closed and it's got the insect inside. It is digested and becomes lunch. The same way that the process happens here with the bladderwort plant that's in the water, the bladder is a trap. It's hollow, and we can see it here because it's shiny and clear and it reflects the sun. It has a trap door, and it invites the insect in. Once the insect is in, the door snaps shut, and the buggy becomes lunch. I have only one thing to say about the blueberries at Pinhook, they are delicious. I took a photo as I was leaving the bog and, and it tickled me when I saw it on my computer. I had no idea what I took a picture of. I just knew it was one as I was leaving. When I got it on my computer, I saw that this looks like an eye and this looks like another eye. And as I'm walking down the boardwalk to leave, I walk into the gaping maw of this monster Happy Halloween, everyone. I've never personally experienced a bog in Europe, but they are there. Holland, Ireland, Denmark, Germany, they all have bogs. People used to use the peat from the bogs for fuel. They would come out with their peat shovels and dig cubes of it, blocks of it, take it back to their homes, dry it up, and use it to heat their homes and to cook with. While they were digging in these bogs, they tended to find things. Among the things they found were kegs of butter. 
And back in the Iron Age, I guess, and medieval times as well, people needed places to keep stuff that needed to be cold. We, we know that uh, butter will go rancid if you don't keep it in the fridge. And early man knew that fact too, they learned. So they figured the bog is cold, it will keep their butter from spoiling. And maybe some of them forgot where they put it and so it stayed there. I can buy that theory, but not for the many kegs of butter that were found there. 270 and counting. And it is said that the butter, you know that butter, uh, it, well, it's, it's, it's a fat and fat resists water. So the water didn't penetrate the butter, but it encapsulated it, kept it cold. And the chemicals in the water that come from the peat, some of those chemicals are antibacterial and antifungal, as well as the acidity. The cold water, all of that helped to preserve that butter. It's said that even though it has kind of a funky scent right now that it could still be edible, that, that makes me think about the honey that was found in the Pharaoh's tombs that we're told it's still edible because honey never, never spoils. Um, I'm, I'm not gonna be eating any of those, but it's, it's a fun thought. Among the other things that were found in the peat bogs in Europe were ancient articles of everyday living and the spoils of war. Some people found these beautiful decorated shields and swords and axes. Um, maybe they captured these from a defeated enemy and sacrifice them to the bog? I don't know. And some of those kegs of butter may have been sacrificed to the bog as well. Bogs were pretty mysterious places to early man. They are kind of mysterious to us as well. And it could very well be that those were sacrifices to the bog. That red item on the left that was radiocarbon dated to 2700 BC is oak. We know oak is very strong wood. It's hand carved. It's still wood, unlike the petrified forest where the wood is, it, it disappears and it's replaced by minerals. So it's a, it's a mineral made tree. It looks like a tree, but it's now it's all minerals. That's not it. This is not a fossil. This is the original hand carved wheel that's almost 5,000 years old because when it, once it came out of the, the bog, it dried up and that's what happens to wood when it's waterlogged and dried. One last thing I'd like to show you that was taken from a, bo a bog in Denmark. It's called Talonman for where it was found. It is what is called, and I'm not being disrespectful when I say this, it's called a bog body. Cadavers have been found in the bog, perfectly preserved. The acidity in the water leaches the calcium from the bones, so they are pretty flat, but they are Totally, the soft, soft tissue is totally preserved. I know you're curious as to why his skin is blue when that piece of wood is red. I can't answer that. I can see that the leather braided around his neck, that is a skin and it's blue. His face is a skin, it's blue. His leather hat is a skin and it's blue. The only thing red there, if you look carefully, is his five o'clock shadow on his chin, it's red, his hair is red, and the fur on the inside of the cap is red. He's wearing a cap because he died in the winter. How do we know that? From the contents of his stomach that was preserved by the bog. He had 40 different kinds of grain and seeds in his stomach. That was his last meal. 
he looks very peaceful. He looks as though he were sleeping. The theory is that perhaps this man was a religious in his community. And from the time he was young, in his capacity as a religious, he knew that at some time in his adult life, he would be sacrificed to the bog in a ritual. And he was okay with that because he grew up with it. He lived with it all his life. He understood the reason why his community did that. So when he was 40 years old, by that leather necklace that he's wearing, that really is not a necklace, it is a noose, he was hung and he was sacrificed to the bog. Others that were found in the bog did not die a death like that. They died violent deaths. I, I, a number of men, single person. Um, there was even um, a young girl that was found um, uh, who suffered such a death and was placed in the bog. We may never know the reason that some of these things happen. There's one more bog that I'd like to talk about, and it's really very interesting. The articles that were discovered in that bog were radiocarbon dated. They are 10,000 years old. These are Stone Age people that used this bog. And the bog is a little different from the European bogs that we have talked about. Um, even though the water surrounding that bog in, in the wet areas around it were very acidic just by where they were, the, bo the bog at Windover was not very acidic. There was only a small amount of peat in the bottom, so the water was only slightly acidic. And the people that lived at Windover lived a very different lifestyle. They buried their deceased, not murdered people. They buried the deceased of their community within that bog. Because the bog was not acidic with peat to, to emit the chemicals necessary to preserve the soft tissue, only the bone structure was left. Only the bone structure. It did reveal more than you might imagine. The, the corpses that were found at Windover, and by the way, Windover was found by a developer who was there with an intention of building a, a very upscale uh, uh, development. And when he found the first bodies, he knew what he had, and he called the proper people, the scientists, the archaeologists, the paleontologists, to come to this area to study it. 168 bodies were found in this underground, uh, underwater cemetery. All ages were found. Probably half of them were children. And as they were studied, a lot of interesting things were discovered about the very people that lived in the community around this bog. They were found to be hunter-gatherers, fishers, but they were not nomadic. They stayed in one place. Well, actually two places. It is, it is thought that these folks were, were kind of snowbirds. They traveled between two places, the, the Windover Bog and then another place with the seasons. I, I, I think that's really, really cute that they were, they were snowbirds. When they occupied the area around Windover, they lived their lives and they buried their dead. They did that with care. They lived their lives with care. They buried their deads with care. The dead were often found buried with an article that meant a lot to them. It talked about who they were. It talked about their values, talked about what they did. 
For instance, there was a little child, not yet three, who was found with what was evidently her favorite toy. One of the items, there were two things. One of the items was made from bone and the end was kind of blunted and wider, slightly rounded. And then the other item was a very small turtle shell. It seems that she must have watched her mother grind grain with a mortar and pestle, crush food, prepare food with her mortar and pestle. That was the same thing that the little girl had, but on a bigger scale. She had a much bigger turtle shell and she had a much bigger pestle. So this little girl was buried with her favorite toy and the other children that were buried had similar items that they loved. One of the people that was buried in this bog was an elderly woman who suffered the same uh, aches and pains that we do, the arthritic aches and pains, but she had also had an injury at one point that rendered her incapacitated. And she evidently, in order to live to the ripe old age that she did, she was taken care of. Now, remember that some communities of Stone Age people, some civilizations actually killed old people. They shunned them. They ran them out of Dodge. They didn't take care of them. The children were obviously taken care of and, and loved. There was a boy who was 15 who had spina bifida. He was born with that malady. He was taken care of by these people and survived until he was taken by an injury at 15 years old. It was also discovered by the articles that were found in the bog that these folks were very artistic for their time. And they decorated their tools, they decorated their implements. The reed baskets that they wove were quite extraordinary. Oh, and one more thing, I guess I didn't tell you this. When the bodies were found in the bog, they were found wrapped in cloth shrouds, cloth. Now, when we think of Stone Age people, what are they wearing? They're wearing skins. These folks wore cloth. Now, Stone Age people probably figured out how to tie a stone onto an antler to make a hammer. What else did they do with the material that they tied with? They figured out how to make thread, even though it was primitive and more like twine. They made it out of plant fibers, a very tedious process. Can you imagine pulling apart a leaf? Um, maybe they had to dry it first, I don't know. And then they had to twist those, those fibers into a thread. And imagine how long that thread had to be in order to create something with it. It was miraculous in the first place that they figured out a weaving process, the warp and the weft, the sideways, the up and down threads of weaving to make cloth. And then imagine the size of the loom that they had to use in order to create a shroud that was big enough to cover a human. Pretty amazing stuff. So all that was left of these folks that were buried in the bog at Windover were their skeletons. That doesn't mean that it, it could be determined what they ate because as the bodies were laid in this bog, they were laid with their heads pointing north, but with their faces facing east, like toward the rising sun. So everybody laid in the same position and you could tell where the different organs should be within that skeleton and where the stomach should be on some of them, you could tell what their last meal was. One person had a number of herb-type plants 
well preserved in the area where her stomach should have been. And she had 3,000 3, elderberry seeds. Um, I don't know if she was eating them for medicinal purposes or if she just liked elderberries. Um, if you wanted to sequence the DNA of these people, you had to have some soft tissue. We know that the bogs took away their soft tissue. An amazing find happened. Of those 168 bodies in the bog, 91 were found to have intact preserved brain tissue. A skull was opened and out rolled this little round desiccated object. It was obviously a brain. So 91 brains were tested for DNA and the folks who were doing the testing and investigating at the bog expected to find native tissue. Native DNA from where this bog is. And some did show some that native DNA kind of. But what was found in the majority of these brains was DNA from Europe. And I suppose I should tell you where Windover Bog is. It's halfway between Titusville and Orlando. So the scientists that were studying Windover let the water come back in. They only dried a, a small section of it and they took away the drains and let the water come back in and refill. If you passed it today, you wouldn't know it was anything special because look at how exciting the discovery of genome sequencing is to us now. It has led to so many different discoveries that we never thought we would find. And scientists are aware of the fact that in the future, other important discoveries will be made that allow them to find out even more information about Windover. One last thing about bogs. When is a bog not a bog? When it's a fen. Henry Coles studied Coles bog for years. We know him as the father of ecology. He determined that the area was a bog. It has since been determined that groundwater is emitted, is, is submitted into the bog, and the bog also allows water to go into the groundwater. Therefore, it is not a bog, it is a fen. And you can see that it has wetland plants. Here's a little arum and some um, reeds that are growing. This sadly is not a bog, but we're not gonna call it Coles Fen. We will always call it Foles, Coles Bog. Lastly, and finally, let's see what we have left. When this country was born, when we were first called America, 25% of the land mass was covered with wetlands. That's how it's supposed to be. That's how everything functions swimmingly, if you will excuse that. 200 years later, this is what we had. Five and a half percent left. If you were to do it with the top five states in our country, California wins the crown. They've eliminated 91% of their wetlands. In fifth position is Illinois. We Hoosiers share fourth place with Missouri. If you were to look at it state by state, you can see what is lost percentage-wise in every state. Here we are in Indiana. We have less than 15% of our wetlands left. Very sad. And Alaska wins the internet, internet with having lost only a tenth of 1% of its wetlands. I would imagine that scientists are studying those wetlands 
uh, with great energy because they have more than, than we have now anywhere. And how would we lose a wetland? How, how would a wetland not exist anymore? Uh, it could be made into farmland. It could, we could lose a wetland for the development of um, house, uh, houses, uh, to build roads, to build a shopping center, to mine. Wetlands can be lost for a variety of reasons. In the 50s and 60s, the United States lost 475,000 acres of wetland. Then came the 70s and 80s with Nixon's Clean Water Act, and you can see the improvement. And then in the 80s and 90s, look at that. It really caught on. Improvements were really apparent by that time, so that by 2009, only 13,000 acres of wetlands were lost. And we think that 13,000 is a lot, and it is. But statisticians tell us that it is nothing when you compare with the 475,000 acres. There was a time when farmers were paid to convert wetlands into farmland. Then they were paid in the Obama era to revert them back to wetlands. Um, different farm bills expired and then new ones were made. And then we came into the era of mitigation banks. It's quite a, quite a complicated process of replacing wetlands. But I have to say that um, in the Obama area, era, things were improved, but at this point in time, some of those rollbacks have been made and there are a couple that do involve wetlands. I don't know if that really stuck. Um, time will tell. I know you all want to know what you personally can do to help the situation. First of all, we can preserve what we have and not lose anymore. We can become activists in our own ways and preserve what we have. If you are lucky enough to have uh, a, a number of acres, you can know what's, what's there on your land. You can know what's on your neighbor's land, know what's in your county, know what's in your state, and help to preserve what's there. Conservation is really important. We're back to thinking about a watershed and how water flows through different areas. Be mindful of the fact that it flows through your very yard. Through your yard. Be mindful of what you put down in your yard. If the water coming through farm fields picks up fertilizer and perhaps a little glyphosate and it picks up manure out of grazing areas and it picks up petrochemicals off the pavement, chemicals out of industrial era areas, your yard is on a much smaller scale. But if you've read Doug Tallamy's book, Bringing Nature Home, you know what he said. We're going to bring nature back one yard at a time. And through your mindfulness, a lot can be done. Restoration is not beyond our reach. Here's an example of a wetland being used as a dump. How terrible. But we see it. We see it happening. And we can join in the groups that do cleanups. Nature Conservancy is amazing, it's nationwide. Locally, we have Shirley Hines Land Trust. They do cleanup days. And if you can't do the cleanup, you can, you can work with these organizations in more clerical capacity. So restoration is not beyond our reach. When you come to Gavis Arboretum today, you can walk over to the wetland and sit in that overlook and you can see the fruits of restoration. When Damien and Rita gave us, bought this land that is now the Arboretum, Damien did some research and he discovered that it was depleted farmland. Before that, can you believe it was a converted wetland? So with careful research and consultation, the wetland then, to, if, as you're looking at this picture, to the left is the deeper side. 
That was dredged out a bit to accommodate the deeper fish. And on the right side, it was dredged only a little to accommodate the, the fry, the minnows, the young fish, to protect them in the plants and to allow dabbling ducks to dabble, allow the wading birds to be there. And then all the drainage mechanisms were removed, whether it was tile, dams, levees, all that was removed and the water was allowed to return. And like that movie, that baseball movie says, build it and they will come, they sure did. Look here, the plants have returned, the willows on the banks, here we have some reeds back here. Here's some, here's some other grassy plants uh, that are peculiar to wetlands. Yes, build it and they will come. So there is light at the end of the tunnel. Um, when I finished uh, hikes with, uh, with classrooms of kids, I always kept some fun facts for the end. So I have some for you. In regard to floods, did you know that just an acre of wetlands can store a million and a half gallons of flood water. How wonderful is that? And then we know it's only slowly released to go find the ocean. And what about birds? Did you know that up to one half of America's bird species nest or feed in wetlands? A half of them. And lastly, the percentages. Although wetlands occupy only 5% of the land surface in the lower 48, they are home to 31% of our land species. Now you know. And here's another goodie for you. If I, if I was uh, talking to you face to face, I'd have handouts for you. But this um, ecologically speaking, is probably better. I've listed some um, links here to websites that I know you will enjoy. If you picked up information that was valuable to you during this webinar, this will really interest you quite a bit. I've listed six sites here. Um, one of them, the fourth one is, uh, uh, it originates from the DNR in the state of Michigan, but it's not peculiar only to Michigan. There's a bunch of stuff in there that's super interesting. And if I had to pick one as my favorite, that would be it. Um, the first one obviously um, has to do with clean water. Um, the second one is uh, a study by Purdue and it has to do with Porter County. So visit these sites, and you're, I'm not gonna ask you to try to scribble these down and get them all correct. I put this slide on my Facebook page, so you can go to Facebook and go to Victoria Justice, that's my Facebook page, and the last post is this particular slide, and you can use it as you wish. You click right on it and go to the website that, that you choose. On that note, I'm going to ask Peyton if we have any questions from the attendees. Right, and I'll also be sending this recording out to everyone who registered. So um, we have your email, so I'll send this recording so you can go back and rewatch or get these links as well um, from that too. So um, let's see. If anyone has any questions, you can put them in the chat, or if you want to unmute yourself to ask, that's fine too. And if, if any other questions come up, I will be sending these out. So you can always reply back to that email and um, I can always let Victoria know that you guys have questions, so. If we're finished then, again, I'd like to thank you all for stopping by. I hope you picked up some information that piques your interest. Um, and when you look up Wendover, <laughs> have a fine time sipping your coffee or your tea and perusing the websites. Again, thanks for coming. Bye-bye, folks. Everyone have a great Saturday. <laughs>